The Speaking from Experience Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, presented by Champlain College's BYO Biz Program, brings leading entrepreneurs to campus to share their experience and wisdom with students and the local community. In this episode, we present Jason Leventhal, founder and president of Line Skis. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Bob Block. I'm the director of the BYO Biz Program, Build Your Own Business. We work with all kinds of student entrepreneurs and other folks, uh, help them build their businesses. Uh, this is Speaking from Experience, and tonight we have a great program for you. But before we begin, I want to give one commercial message for our final speaker of this semester, which is uh, Tuesday, November 12th. And we are very excited because we're going to have one of our own alums uh, up here to talk. Uh, Ian Frisch graduated from Champlain in 2009 with a degree in professional writing. And um, he, uh, when he was here, he had a great business with a, uh, he bought one of those short bus ice cream truck, you know, short bus, short buses, painted it purple and sold ice cream in all, all around Burlington in the summer, made a lot of money. A true entrepreneur. Anyway, he goes to New York, uh, gets a job as an intern for Rolling Stone, kind of disappears for a while, and then emerges about a year and a half ago as the founder and editor-in-chief of a very glossy, sophisticated fashion and lifestyle magazine called Relapse. And um, I got to tell you, that is one of the toughest businesses to make a go of it in. And he's making a go of it. And he's having a lot of fun in Brooklyn, New York. So he's going to be up here on November 12th. And I invite all of you to come out and uh, yeah, hear what he has to say, because it's going to be a really interesting. Now, tonight, speaking of really interesting, well, first, let me ask you a question. Come on in. Hey, Steve. Um, hey, Steve. How many people here are skiers or snowboarders? I'm sure. <coughs> Is that, are these your people? Yeah, for sure. Okay. Well, um, then uh, you don't know why you're here. I know you want to learn something uh, for maybe a, a, a business class or something, but, but you're probably also here to learn and hear about the ski business and skiing. And we're so lucky to have Jason Leventhal with us tonight. He is a true... Hi, Francis. Come on in. Oh, Sit right in the front. Um, he is a true entrepreneur. Um, many people, in fact, many people in this room probably have had great ideas from time to time, and you're all excited about them, and then you kind of move on to something else and you don't really do anything with it. Well, Jason's a guy who had a really interesting, simple idea, what, what back in the mid-90s or something? Yeah. And what do you know? He went and did something with it. And he chased it, and he pursued it, and he built a great business and then another business and now I, he'll tell you all about his new business that he's on to. Um, all in the ski business, all doing something he loves to do. And so without further ado, let's have a warm welcome for Jason Leventhal. All right. all right. I got lots of crazy ideas too that I never follow up on. You can ask my family about that. So that, that's perfectly normal. Um, well, thanks. I mean, I'm a local here. Uh, I've been living here for 11 or 12 years now. And um, when you see me out in the hill, wave me down. Let's take a run. And um, I'll never leave this place. I've had opportunities to work in other places. And you know, I'd rather give up my job or my passion than, than leave. This place is really special. You guys are all so lucky to go to school or just live here in general. Um, so this is basically my past 18 years. This is just kind of a random cartoon. And it's basically, whenever you've got a good idea, it's usually a crazy idea. Um, or it's so obvious, it's unobvious. And whoever's running the show at the time is um, too busy trying to figure out how to make status quo work for them to stop and actually change the entire process and go with something new. And those are the people that are complaining that they're running out of money or the sales are down or this and that. And 
I'm not a business person. I'm a skier. Okay. So don't think that I'm some genius coming in here with a degree in any which way. I'm a graphic designer and I'm a product kind of graph designer. No engineering. Uh, if I had to take accounting classes at college, I would never have graduated. I was lucky enough to go to University of Buffalo for graphic and product design. I didn't have to read many books. I just basically got creative with my hands and my mind and, and uh, did really well because I was doing what I love. So I guess I'll just jump all over because that's the way my mind works. But I would say to everyone here, if you're going to school, go for what you enjoy. Forget about what you're going to make when you get out. Forget about what your friend or your parents expect you to do or don't expect you to do or what you think you may want to become. Just go for something you enjoy because if you enjoy it, you're going to do well at it. It's just like a hobby. It moves from a, from a job, which people have to actually pay you to do, to something you enjoy doing, and they'll pay you, and you'll be the best at it. So that's my two cents for the day as far as go to school for something you love. And uh, at the end, if you go for school for something you don't like and graduate, start doing something you do enjoy. And again, whether it has to do with what you went to school for or not, even though your parents won't appreciate that comment. Okay. <coughs> So this is where I started back in the 80s. I was a kid into BMX biking, into skateboarding, and really BMX bikes came from regular cycles, okay? Just people riding around in big wheels with 10 speeds, and suddenly they're doing tricks because the bikes evolved, okay? A BMX bike at the time was five years, 10 years earlier than that, had no nothing like this in terms of being able to spin the bars and the way the brakes worked and the way all the pegs that came out and the mags and the tricks. It enabled the sport to progress. And same with skateboarding. They were very directional. And so they went twin tip. As soon as the skateboard got tip and tail, you could do kick flips back, you know, you sw switch. Everything went both ways in terms of doing tricks. And you can just do so much more that more people wanted to participate in the sport. And then it was, it was snowboarding came around because skiing was really lame. It was kind of boring. It was like you go straight down the hill. You can ski bumps. You can do a 360 and you can race. Maybe you can do a 720. You can do a daffy or a double daffy. And snowboarding, in the meantime, you're sliding rails, you're riding a half pipe, you're riding backwards, you're carving. So this was my first snowboard back in the day. I was, I, I was one of the first kids in my school to snowboard and I still ski because I love skiing, but snowboarding came around, you could do so much more because the product evolved to enable people to do more and more people want to participate in the sport. Same with inline skating. At the time, I mean, that evolved from, from basically roller skates and then the grind plates came out and people started grinding and again, it's just, Another example of a sport growing and evolving. Same with wakeboards. That was my first board, the, the 69. That was when wakeboards were first invented. And none of these pictures of Nate. But, you know, at the time, everyone was water skiing. Like, sure, you know, you get a boat, you go water skiing. When suddenly this comes out, you can do so much more. There's magazines about it. There's, there's, there's whole shops based on wakeboarding. Now websites, videos. A whole scene appeared out of just a simple evolution of the product. You basically took a water ski, made it twice as wide, and twin tip. You know? um, this was skiing at the time in the 90s, the late 90s. So racing, moguls, and extreme skiing. There's Scott Schmidt and Upright. I watched that movie like every day. I came home from school and I lived to do that iron cross over little bushes at my local mountain. And that was about as rad as it got. Um, that was the buyer's guide. That was the product. I mean, look at how straight they're straight because they're made for downhill skiers that are going 80 miles an hour on a race course. That's it. So when you're riding around your local mountain, there's not much you can do. You skid around, square tail, super pointy tip, super, super stiff. You're set back, way in the back. So here you think about, you know, think about these two sports. I'm going to the mountain and half the day I'm riding my snowboard, half the day I'm riding my skis. You can't do anything on these compared to that. You walk into a store. You watch a snowboard video, you watch a ski video, you look at snowboard mag, that's the cover of snowboard mag. Here you're doing a pencil 1080, you know, barely. <laughs> so it's like these sports were just so far away. And so that's when in 95, I basically made this, which at the time people couldn't even digest it being a, called a ski. It was basically a snowboard. I took my snowboard, cut the dimensions in half, half the width, half the length, made it twin tip, made it center mounted, symmetric, gave it a flex pattern. I was basically riding skis that were like a snowboard, okay? And people couldn't even digest the fact that they were skis. To me, it was always skiing. Of course I'm skiing, or otherwise I'd be snowboarding, standing on one of them. I'm standing on two. They look like snowboards, but they were such a huge departure from skiing at the time that no one could even call it a, a ski. They were calling them ski boards. 
Um, this is the first press I made at college. Like I said, I went to school for, for design studies at University of Buffalo, and I basically made a press out of a big block of wood, got some copper pipes to heat it up, boiled it on my camp stove, boiled water and ran it through the pipes to heat it. And um, I, you know, I just asked a lot of questions, just anyone that was in the trades, um, how do you make a, how would you do this? Like, how would you create pressure? How would you create heat? I had a car jack for the pressure. Um, I knew some people making snowboards at the time. There was about 300 snowboard brands, kind of where skiing is now going, where everyone was in their garage making snowboards. So I'd hook up with them and, and figure things out. And so that was my first press. And that's the garage that I moved home after college and started making skis in. This is a one car garage in Albany, New York, Abelman Ave. That's a one car garage. And then I built a little garage in the garage. So you can only imagine how tiny that was. But basically that first day when I went skiing, I was able to slide picnic tables. I was able to ski backwards, do 180s, do tricks that I never thought possible on skis prior to that. I had been doing that all the time on my snowboard. And I literally, at the end of the day, halfway through the day at Stratton, after getting off my snowboard, I'd get on my skis and I'd just instinctively do a 180 on the snow and start skiing backwards. I'd be like, wait, I can't do that. You know, these things don't have tips. But it was just that it took years of thinking about it before I went to college and some teacher said, hey, you've got to do a senior project. And I said, I'm going to make this ski, and I did, and it worked out. And I went home, and I started making them in my garage. Now, I'm not independently wealthy. I had to make money on the side to, to fund this kind of hobby at the time. So I was building these decks, you know, like a deck on the back of your house. I always did carpentry in the summer. So I'd build a deck for a week or two, and then I'd build some skis for a week or two. And uh, that was my press in the garage. That was the beginning of the line logo can of spray paint, but basically all the steel, I just bought a welder, a used welder, and I learned how to weld. I mean, nothing's impossible, man. It's like everything's just like learning a trick, right? When you're going down a hill, you see a jump, you see a rail, you see a line through the trees. You never did that before. It doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you haven't done it. And the only way to know, learn how to do it is to just drop in and go and drop in with both feet. And that's what I did. Now, a lot of that was just my own ignorance of what I was actually getting into. If someone laid out or if I actually digested what I was getting into, I probably never would have started. So it's kind of ignorance is bliss in a way. It's good sometimes to just not even know what you're doing. And especially at this age, it's like, how much do you got to lose, really? And I'll show, talk about that a little later. This is me in my basement. I just took over the family basement after a while making skis, bandsaw, homemade sander. This was the terrain park at Stratton at the time. This is me on my skis called ski boards at the time that gap jump, and this is my brother on a snowboard. These are me and my friends, like, you know, the outlaws at the time. People would just be like, what are those? Um, but no skiers were allowed in the park. They were called snowboard parks. So here I am, a skier my whole life. I was, you know, loved jumping like anyone, but there was no place to do it. You'd actually get snowballs thrown at you by snowboards or snowboarders if you rolled through the park. They'd hassle you, ha hassle you and yell at you, and the, uh, the uh, ski patrol would rip your ticket or take away your ticket if you're caught in there. But I wasn't going to stop. I mean, I'm in there on my snowboard half the day. I'm in there on my skis. It's like, you know, someone's got to do something here to, like, show that this is possible. So me and my friends would, just, would roll through the park there. We were almost locals. This is a patent that I got on the ski at the time for being twin tip. I remember someone asking, well, why would you want a twin? Why do you want to go back? Well, first they're saying, well, I don't get it. Why do you want a twin tip? Like, what's that for? It's to go backwards. Then it's, why do you want to go backwards? <laughs> and to me, it was just like, why wouldn't you want to go backwards? You know, like I go backwards on my wakeboard, my snowboard, my skateboard, you know, everything. Like why, why wouldn't you, you know? So it was, this was an example of something that was really, really obvious. So obvious it was unobvious to the point that I got a patent on it. And I never really enforced the patent. You need a lot of money to actually enforce it. And it was also a design patent, which is more the aesthetic look of that ski. But we were for good 10 years, the only ones making equal height tips and tails. And I wouldn't have it any other way. I mean, my snowboard was always equal height tip and tails, twin tip. And you know, when the other companies started making these, these twin tip skis, they were really low tails, you know, just a little kink in the back. This is my first trade show. Scraped together every bit of money I could find. My uncle even loaned me his flyer miles to get a hotel and a flight out there at SIA in, in Las Vegas. So this is the guy that made my bindings. And uh, there I am on the right, and we're stoked. It's literally a 10 by 10. I mean, it's the booth, the entire booth is like that, you know? So I had my, my five pair. I only made 30 pair at the time, probably. You know, like I'd go to Jimney Peak in Massachusetts 
and I'd go skiing for the day, come back, change the ski, build another one the next day, then the following day, go test it. And that was just awesome. It was fun. I learned something every, you know, trial and error is, the, is king here um, when you're developing something new and, and it's the best way to learn. So anyway, came home from that trade show with no orders. I probably talked to five people the whole show. <clears throat> At that show, there was about 300 snowboard brands. So that was going off. And you know, it was kind of a little sideshow here. And there's actually a couple other companies making them, from, one from Colorado, one from California, um, to my surprise, which was cool. And I kind of left the show a little bit, you know, thinking I just wasted so much time. I and mean, when I was in my garage, I was working like literally 7 a.m. till like 11 at night. I mean, it was just like there was nothing else in life, you know, than that. It just, I got so in the zone. Um, and here I went to a trade show, walked away with nothing until I got a fax a couple weeks later at the copy store. It was an order for a thousand pair from a Japanese distributor. I mean, he got my fax number that I had at the trade show. He was probably one of only like five guys I ever talked to during the show. And um, so everyone says to me, so now what are you gonna do? Like, this is a big problem, man. You've only made like 30 pair in a little garage. You make like one a day. And I said, that's the best problem you can have. You know, I mean, that's what you need to start. You know, sometimes it's carpet before the horse, sometimes vice versa. One way or another, you gotta get going. You know, you gotta drop in. So I got all my equipment in a, in a flatbed, went to it, rented out a bigger garage. These are my friends from high school. This guy's still, Matt Conley, he still uh, sells skis for Lime. He's a rep in California. And uh, Tom and Matt, the other Matt, these guys are friends from school. And, Rallied my brothers, my dad worked there, he'd bend edges sometimes for us, and, and we got a thousand pair done. I mean, that's me cranking them out, that's me cutting them out every day. I'd cut out like 30 pair that we made the day before, and we just went for broke. And the end of the summer, we sold them, we shipped them, a thousand pair. Um, this is the next winner. This is Mike Nick, he's the guy who runs Orage right now, he's actually in town too. And uh, he's a, a friend in high school. And he was just that kid in high school that would like jump out of two story buildings into like an above ground pool. He'd be doing like double backflips off of like, you know, anything. He was always the best at whatever he tried. He was a natural athlete. So he jumps on me, I go, Mike, here you go. And he just went nuts. Like that's a sledding hill he's doing Misty Fives. Back in 1996, all right? People weren't even skiing backwards. Like me and him were at Mount Snow figuring out how to ski backwards. We were like, snow plowing down, looking uphill. Then we were like looking over the shoulder, like, I think I got it. It's like, you know, two weeks later, it's like, no, this is the way to do it. It's like, try scissoring your feet. You know, like, I mean, there were guys by, by 99, there were still dudes in the X games, like doing backwards snow plows, you know, like we figured out finally, it's kind of like ice skating or inline skating where you're like, you know, the way it's done now. But at the time it wasn't that obvious. Anyway, he was, he was just unbelievable, you know, doing switch fives and whatever. He, he won gold. I won bronze. That was the first ski event in the X Games slope style. That's the first slope style ski event. There, there was no such thing at the time, just snowboarding. For years, snowboarding was in it. I think that might have been the third or fourth X Games. Um, so that launched us big time. Now all of a sudden, we're the legit brand. There's our half pipe out back behind our factory. Um, and then this is the factory. So that launched us as like, holy cow, th these are the dudes from the X Games. This is this dude's ski company. And Solomon at the time, I might have skipped over that, they jumped in the game and they really, they're the ones who got it in the X Games. There are other brands, other ski companies saying, wait a second, this is what's next. Like these snowboard guys have been taking our cake. Like they're getting all the attention. They're the cool dudes on the hill. They're growing their sales. Like skiing's declining. It's lame. It's an old man sport. And, and wait a second, now there's these little twin tip ski things that everyone wants and it's fresh and it's alive. So Solomon, uh, Dina Star, um, K2, they all jumped in the game. And this is us pressing skis. And this, I even made Dina Star's first ski up there. I made a hundred pair, the guys came to the factory. I was like, are you serious? Do you want me to make your skis? And they were like, yeah, we gotta get into this. You know, this is the hot shit. And it's like North American distributor. And then I went to the trade show and they had the exact copy made in France. So they just used me to make a hundred pair to get samples out so they could just get a head start. And that's just how you, you, you don't know any better, but it didn't matter. Cause at the end of the day, those guys were followers. We were leaders. Being first is everything. So here we are getting tons of press. So it's like, here's me and Mike chairman of the boards. I mean, every spin on words you could think of 
you know, ski boarding, a new thrill on the hill. It's like, that's the only thrill in skiing in such a long time. They're eating up New, York, new Yorker Newsweek. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? I mean, you still haven't seen skiing in Newsweek in the last 10 years. And, and then these are trade magazines, you know? It's like, I mean, this was, this was it. This is where it was going. And, you know, yeah, they're short, but at the end of the day, if you take, add another 20 centimeters to this end and 20 centimeters to this end, this ski 15 years ago was a hell of a lot closer than anything at the time. You could laugh at it, you could make fun of it. You know, I, I laugh at it too, but, it, but realistically, this was like, you were looking through into the future. It was just a dramatic, it was just different from today, but it was a lot closer than what existed. And look at all those brands making them. Um, and then this is me, first photo published on a handrail. This is in Albany, New York. There's Mike with a million X Games medals, like he was unbeatable. And then we started making the long skis in 99. This is when the Salomon 1080 came out. There's Pollard on the, on the far right. He was skiing with no poles back then. He actually was disqualified from an X Games qualifier because he wasn't using poles. Meanwhile, Henrik Carlo this past year, wins the X Games with no poles, never skis with poles in the park. You don't need poles in the park. Um, and so there's me filming him. But you know, Pollard was so ahead of his time. This is like 13 years ago. He's skiing without poles and getting dissed. And movie companies like Matchstick wouldn't even film him. Like, no, we're not going to film you until you put poles in your hands which at the time was kind of normal, you know, and there are still people today that you'll meet that have an issue with. There's, there's Chris Osnes, Skogan Sprang. These guys are all just wicked pioneers and they, they got, you know, what I was doing was what they were envisioning as well. We were all in the same vision. There were obviously other dudes doing like pencil 720s and whatnot, but these guys are doing, you know, parallel ski, slow rotation, cork, off axis spins, you know, literally inventing like the McTwist, the switch rodeos, like all these, all these tricks that today are, are just the building blocks of what is now continues to evolve was developed by this crew. And, um, and, and this is kind of like the high point in 99 where like I, I have an article in the New York Times, you know, manufacturing the next extreme sport, like New York Times comes to my garage. I mean, it was just like, holy shit, this is going off. But at the same time, the reality of the business that I never went to school for was I owe $300,000 to the banks. So now I'm 25, 26 years old, right? Five, five years out of college. I owe 300 grand to the banks, personally signed for. I owe $40,000 worth of credit cards. I still have some of those cards. I got $20,000 limits because I paid this off somehow eventually. Uh, and then 20 grand I owe my mom even. So I'm in the hole, $360,000. I'm renting an apartment with my girlfriend in Albany, so I don't own anything in terms of that. I am borrowing my parents' pickup truck, okay? I'm renting a space to make skis, and I don't have the money to even make one more ski. I literally go to that trade show with about five pair. I say to my friends who are working for me, I go, we're, we're going to go to this show, and we're going to sell like hell, okay? But I don't have a dollar to pay you a week beyond we get back, and I don't have materials and I need I want the money to update the machines to even go into production. We're going to try to get an investor and either we are or we aren't. But to, you know, to give up, to just kind of wave the flag, why would I have gone through all that, you know, to not at least try? So we go to a trade show, people are stoked, patting us on the back. I somehow get an investor over the next month and it's Carhu. They're uh, Carhu and Track. They're um, they make cross-country skis. They're based here. And I moved up from Albany to Burlington. And they have a factory in Montreal. Steve here worked for them. And uh, they saved the day. I mean, we would have been gone. We would have been that those guys were so cool. That's how they would have referred to us. Remember them. Remember line. You know, but we, we just pushed it to the limit and hit that glass ceiling and got saved just in the nick of time. Basically went for broke and almost did go broke. Um, this is the new factory up in Canada. So now we're, we've got solid production. This is actually the same owners who were building Burton snowboards uh, for 20 years. Uh, different factory, but they own this. They, they know, had all the know-how to build the <coughs> top quality skis. And that's the year, you know, in 2000 when the twin tips, the full length skis came out. Solomon, Rossi, uh, Volant, and we've got the Osnes Dragon there. And we're, we're the only ones that are full height tip and tail. We're just, this is all we do. I mean, it's all about positioning when you're building a brand or you have a product. Like, 
You don't want to be everything to everyone. You know, like think about the best brands you know. They're strong because they only do one thing and they do it the best. They live it and they breathe it. And uh, that's what we were for this segment. Everyone made skis, sure. Everyone started making a ski that could kind of do that. But we were, we were way ahead of our time because that was our only focus. And then we got Chris Osnes in the cover of Powder, completely launched us. I mean, you could just see that little white tip, the little tail. That had never been seen before on a cover. What's he on? What are those? Like, I know it's weird now, but that was the first cover on a Fulham Twin Tip Ski. And the fact that he was on our skis, that's a McTwist, first time ever published, and that was our ad. It was a lot of firsts, you know, first Scoving Sprang, first time on a handrail on a cover. There's Pollard on the right with his friends, his snowboard buddies hitting a quarter pipe at Hood. Um, Scogan on the cover of Powder, the future. Basically, we built this wide ski. We took a, a park ski and we doubled the width in about three, two days. He was literally called us, hey, I need a powder ski. I got invited to AK. I'm going on Saturday. Can you make me a ski? And we just took our park ski and boom, widened it. 72 hours later, shipped it out to him and it launched the Mothership, which was the first twin tip wide powder ski at 98 waist. No one could believe how wide that was at the time. That was just a year before the pocket rocket. Um, and this was the team. You know, Mike Nick, Mike Wilson, Dash Long, Eric Pollard, Skogan Sprang. There's Wilson on the far right, just going ballistic. Freeze Magazine, like Line, we're ranked top four. Um, and then we come out with this binding. We had this idea for inserts on a ski and a releasable heel. So this engineer in town, Dave Dodge, who's done a lot of inventing of a lot of products for ski boots and snowboards and whatnot, he came to us with this binding idea. We said, yeah, let's do it. It was kind of, again, like putting my head down and just running as fast as we could not really thinking about what was ahead of us. And uh, we went for it and it, people liked it. I mean, look, Line has become a respected Alpine ski manufacturer. I mean, this is eight years into it. Now, now we're respected. Like we're literally, I would go to a ski test and they would take our ski, they'd say, why are you here? You should just throw them downstairs to test them. Because, you know, pe they saw people sliding rails. They don't have any respect for that. I mean, this month, Lines on the cover of their magazine, but at the time, I remember, I remember, I remember Joe saying that. There's one of the guys saying it to me, and uh, it made me realize it takes a lot to get in, man. Don't, 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 don't give up the first time you fall. Anyway, we got this binding going off, and again we hit a glass ceiling. We spent so much money on that binding that again we were about to go out of business. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but the more successful you are, the more money you actually need. And when you don't get that money to, to, to move forward, you're kind of running out of gas. You're on this really fast highway and you're running out of gas. You're about to get crushed by the car behind you. Um, and that's where we were at. So we looked rad, we were killing it in theory, but financially it was really tough. And that's when basically desperate times uh, call for desperate measures. And that's kind of me as an inventor or you, know, you guys are just solving an everyday problem I invent not just a product, but just like ways to, to come up with solutions. Um, and I kind of feed off that. You know, if you give me a problem, like we run out of money, we're about to go out of business, how are we gonna keep marketing? This is the solution I I'm, I'm came up with. So think different is the heart of it. It's all, that's always the answer is to think different. Like no one needs another of the same thing. Another of the same thing is because you're just thinking like you did yesterday or thinking like the guy next to you is thinking. You have to think different. If you don't think different, no one needs you. Okay, because people don't need anything unless it's different. They already have what isn't different. So exploit the competition's competitors' strengths as weaknesses. So what are you good at? Whatever you're the best at, I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna beat you because I'm gonna turn that into your weakness. And that's how you do it. Like PCs are really strong. Like Microsoft is pretty strong. How did, how did Apple kick their ass? How'd they beat them to the phone? How did Apple beat a phone brand, a phone companies? You know, it's just, there's a million examples of this out there, but you got to think about what they do and what usually they're strong at. They have a lot of trouble changing. And if you can't change, then you're going to get passed. So they have big budgets, these other companies, huge budgets. I mean, we we're selling like five, 10,000 skis. They're selling 200,000 skis. They can crush us financially. So why would I ever try to battle them financially? I can't, right? So we have big <laughs> flexibility. 
They have long contracts with movie companies, athletes, magazines. They can't get out of it. They can't change fast. We can. We have no obligations. We just walked into the room today. We, got, you know, we don't necessarily have a lot of friends. We don't have a lot of enemies. We can do whatever we want, wherever we want. So that flexibility, they speak to shops, to dealers. We speak to consumers. Traditional big brands are all about connecting with a retailer that buys their product. I'm a kid that skis and makes skis. I want to sell them to other kids like me. And I'm talking to them in that way. And that's what we did. We speak directly to the consumer. And they're everything to everyone, meaning their brand has no real meaning. It just, it just this brand makes skis, snowboards, inline skates, shoes, whatever else they're making. Even in just the ski world, they're making everything. So they don't really stand for any one thing. We stand for the future of the sport, for freestyle skiing. It's all about positioning. You know, you have to stand on this side of the room and say, I have... I don't want to have anything to do with all that. I only stand for this and let the people come to you. Because if you're running back and forth saying, no, I, I'm also this, I'm also that, I'm, I'm good at this, I make cross country skis, like we're, we're, we're huge in racing, but we're seriously, we're really into freestyle. And we're into powder skiing, you know, but we're into park and a, like, you know, we're super historic. We've been here for 150 years, but we're super progressive and we're down with you, 12 year old, the new school scene. You can't be everything to everyone. That's why Burton's good because they're, they make snowboards. They don't make skis. Burton not making skis makes Burton Burton as much as anything. Think about it. Think about all the other snowboard brands. And they were the first. Being first is something no one else can buy. No one can take away from you. So anything, anyway, they're everything to everyone. We're everything to only the influencers, only the very core, only the people that really have the vision for the future of the sport. Only the most progressive kids out there. So these are the differentiations. These are the gray, the things they're strong at. And the black is how we use that to get around them. So here's a bunch of athletes on a podium at the X Games. And you got to figure, if you typically, if you own those athletes, if they're sponsored by you, then you've got a leg up. Everyone wants the product they're on. That's the traditional thinking. And there's a lot of companies in the last 10 years that came around and went out of business because that's what they thought. They thought if we spend a million dollars to pay that athlete to wear our product, we're, we got it, we're going places. And that doesn't happen. Because how many of you guys have been in, in, in that type of half pipe? Or how many of you guys have been in AK, for example, if you're looking up the big mountain skiers? How many of you been heli skiing? There's all these inspirational th aspects to a sport that you can't relate to. I've never been heli skiing. You know, I'm not, I'm not gonna be that guy. So how do, it's a little harder to inspire. There are people that, are, that aspire to be them for sure, but I can't buy those athletes. I don't have those budgets. So instead of trying and going out of business doing it, I'm just not. I'm completely not, Line has not spot, had a guy in the X Games in the last 10 years. We're the number six company in the US for selling skis, all skis, not just twin tips and stuff. So we'll promote the local heroes. You guys are local heroes. You all relate to local heroes. Like they're skiing on the terrain you ski at, the places you ski at. These guys are making videos every day that we can then distribute and promote. So we're going around the big guys and saying, you guys have your cake over there, have your party. We're going to own this whole scene. And that's what we did. Um, financially, we can't beat the big guys. We can't spend more on advertising. I can't take out more print ads. You open a mag, there's a Rossi print ad, there's, an, there's a Solomon print ad, there's a K2 print ad. What's mine gonna do? It's just gonna, it's just gonna bleed my bank account. It's not gonna win. So instead of doing, spending money on advertising, we pioneered an entirely new playing field, YouTube and online marketing. Way ahead of its time. This is back uh, eight years ago. We basically pulled all our print ads, cut most of our team because we couldn't afford it, kept Pollard, and went to all local heroes and all online advertising. And we still do um, for line. So basically the, the idea here is when, you're, when shit's hitting the fan, stay calm and uh, wave the white flag. I just like that because I feel like I was waving the white flag, but at the same time, find a way around it. And this is who came to the rescue is K2. This is our first sales meeting. They basically bought the company entirely. I owned nothing. I actually didn't even make money selling it um, because it was basically in so much debt again at that time um, that all we could hope for is to keep it alive. And that's what they did. And I got a job 
And these things that I put in place, you know, we stuck with it. And fast forward a few years, we're the kings of online media. So not doing print ads, doing online marketing, not sponsoring X Games guys, sponsoring local heroes got us this. Basically the kings, over 2 million views a year on YouTube. Just blew everyone outside of the water, water owned that medium, owned that playing field that we pioneered, even though everyone's on these social media today, we're still killing it. And our sales grew like this. Not allowed to put numbers to this, but we're selling tens of thousands a pair. And this is where we start. I mean, look at that growth every year. If you put the growth of the ski industry, it's about, you know, it's, it's flat. So the only way for us to get more sales is to take it away from the competition. And we didn't take it away by going over and taking and being them. You know, like here's your traditional ski company, the most traditional. And here we are over here in this corner. We didn't walk over there and try to be them. A lot of our sales guys, a lot of our dealers would have liked that. They thought that might be the answer. Hey, why don't you make what Elon's making? We sell a ton of those carving skis. Or like, why don't you make what these guys are making? Like, we still sell these, you know, these $199, you can get into the sport skis, whatever they are, you know, directional whatevers. And we were like, you know what? I know we're not selling as many, but we're gonna stay here and we let you guys, the customers, come to us. Because eventually one person tells two, two people tell four, four people tell eight, and, and, and your mind, it takes years to come around to saying, you know what, maybe I do want a wider ski, maybe I do want a twin tip ski, maybe I do want a powder ski, maybe I, you know, Sometimes you can be a little ahead of your time, but the key is patience. And um, I didn't always have the patience, but I learned now that that's really, that's the tool I needed the most, is to just stay true to your gut, stick to your vision. And uh, we did, luckily. We didn't sell out, even though we were owned by a big ski company. That was essentially my job, to make sure we stayed, you know, in a true path, stayed core and focused on what we believe in. And that's where we landed. I mean, we're the number six brand in the US. Globally, we're tiny. We barely exist, but North America, there we are. Look at the guys ahead of us. I mean, that's, that, those are some big numbers to beat. I mean, we've, we've already passed most of anyone that we're going to. And um, so there it is, it's accomplished. Like in my mind, 18 years of doing that, and there we are. Look at flat skis. So flat skis is skis without systems, without bindings. Okay, in that category alone, so we're number four. Sometimes we're number three, but you know, there we are. That's what you get when you stick to your vision and seeing the wrong way since 95 is what we've been doing. We've been doing everything wrong. We've been doing everything the opposite. We've been doing everything different. And that's how you get the, the sale. That's how you beat your competition. You don't beat them by looking them in the eye and saying, I'm going to do what you're doing. And you don't even, don't even say, I'm going to do what you're doing, but I'm going to do it better. You say, you do what you're doing and you stay good friends with those guys and let them go there, run their course and you do what you, what you think the future is. So that's, that's, that's the line store part of my story. <laughs> so uh, now I'm gonna tell you, I'll take a little sip here. Uh, and you guys can ask questions. You, wa you wanna ask questions now? When did Casey buy In 2006. See, I did my job to the point you didn't even know. Like that's the hardest part. I mean, when they first did, when they first did, I said, well, that's the end of the line. You know, and that's typically the way, especially someone like me. But I actually didn't move out to Seattle. I worked from home all those years. And I said, you know, if this doesn't, like I said at the beginning, I love this place. And I said, if it doesn't work out, you know, we'll shake hands, go our separate ways. But, you know, I know what I'm, I'm doing with this. This is my baby and I want to make sure it worked. And it did. But the key was staying true to who we were because if we started becoming everything to everyone and started making the same stuff, and K2 has an immense amount of respect for this brand and myself and what line stands for, and we're very, very lucky it was them who bought us because um, I don't think it could have gotten any better. I mean, there just isn't a better, and they're an American company, and they just get it. If you want to sum up K2, they get it, and they respect what line stands for and, and let us stay true to who we were. I'm going to jump into what I'm doing next and then we'll do all the questions. All right. So positioning is everything. Um, when I say positioning, you don't have to be a marketing guy to be positioning. You know, you could any business, anything you're doing. I mean, in your class, you know, where are you in the class? Where are you in your crew? Where are you in your ski posse? You know what I mean? Like 
Where are you when you drop into the park? Like, what's your position? Are you the dude that's doing the styly tricks, not big spins? Are you do, do, doing spins to win? You know what I mean? Like, where, where are you in, in your crew of friends? You know what I mean? Are you like the dork? Are you the cool dude? Are you the tough guy? Like, what, it's positioning, it's everything in life. Just personally, business-wise, product-wise, marketing, sales, you gotta pick a position and run with it. You know, you can't try to be everything to everyone. So this is my new brand. It's just the letter J. And uh, it's basically limited skis by me, sold direct. Those three simple things that no other brand is doing right now. And we're not doing anything else. We're not also selling to shops. We're not also selling just infinite numbers of product. We're selling very small quantities of limited skis and I'm collaborating with people I want to collaborate, and I'm only selling it directly to you guys. And um, so I'll get into the position of this whole thing. So think about respected surfboard shapers, okay? These are people that have built and designed surfboards for years. They build them for the best pros out there. They build them for everyday surfers. And in skiing, that's essentially what I am. If you think about who do you know in skiing or snowboarding that has designed, like name, Name a name that designs skis or snowboards. There really isn't. There's a lot of great engineers, a lot of great designers, tons of people. Even with Line, there was tons of people that I worked with that, that, that were part of the process to create these great products. But my name happens to be synonymous with someone that basically shapes, designs, builds skis. And so my, my idea with this new brand is to leverage that. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm doing this presentation not as like, I'm not pitching you on anything. You guys are all in college. So part of this is like you're supposed to learn something here. So I'm just kind of giving you my perspective of like what's driving me to make the decision that I made to do this and, uh, and, and why and what my goal is for it. So I thought to myself, I've been doing line for you know, 18 years, literally. I could do it in my sleep. It couldn't be any more successful than it is. Um, the sport has gone exactly where I envisioned it that many years ago. And I still have a million ideas brewing that don't necessarily fit into that business program. Nothing wrong with that. I just, I just have these ideas that, are, that I need to do in a different format. And so I need to start a different brand. I'm an entrepreneur and I want that flexibility to wake up in the morning and come up with an idea and then literally sell it tomorrow. You know, I can't, the traditional timeline that everyone's on is too slow in this world that I believe, I think in most industries, but skiing especially is, is the last to catch up. So I think to myself, well, I'm known as a ski designer. Why don't I leverage that on my next thing? So, okay, there it is. There's one piece of it. I've got decades of trust, credibility. People know what I've done. Um, I've got proof. I've got hundreds of thousands of people that have bought my skis, whether they know I made them or not. You know, I have a history. I'm not going into the, uh, you know, the underwear market or, or shoe market where I know nothing about it, no one trusts me and whatnot. This is something I live for and, and I'm known for. So what I'm gonna do now is work with people I wanna work with that I think are influential. So celebrity product collaborations. This is something I'm not inventing. I don't feel like this brand, I'm doing anything new. I'm just bringing what's being done in other worlds into this, just like I did when I started Lime. So think about all the collaboration projects that are going on with other brands, other companies that just aren't happening in skiing. So that's what I, one of the things I want to do. I want to work with celebrities, not just skiers, just anyone, everyone. I mean, it could be goofy, it could be dumb, it could be huge. And this is just another example, like art collaborations. We've always worked with artists for line, but you know, this is really a huge part of what I want to do is really collaborate with them, see them design the product. And, being done with big mainstream brands like Nike. Again, this is nothing new. And then the oldest one, athlete, athlete product collaborations. Like, think about it. Like, Jordan. I mean, that's 20 year old format that works. Like, people still wear Jordan's products. You know what I mean? So, I want to do a lot of this. But these three things is that's really all I want to do. I don't want to just make another widget, another blue ski just to sell it. I want to make something with a deep story and a cool connection. And, and relates to people that follow these other people. So limited editions collaborations, basically one of a kind, limited quantity, and, and that just drives the demand. You know, if, if you, you always want what you can't have. 
We all know that. We've all been there. It's part of it being greener on the other side, which I might be experiencing right now. I'll let you know in, in another year. But um, it creates an urgency to like buy it now and get involved now because it's going to be gone tomorrow. So I also can leverage these people I work with, you know, they're following, like they're, the awareness that they have and the reach that they have. So think about artists, think about skiers. There's Steve Stepp, who I'm collaborating with right now. Um, musicians, random stuff, like whatever's hot that day, whatever's funny, like whatever you think is cool to make a couple pairs of skis with a graphic on. Um, and these are the first skis that I've released in the last two weeks. This is the first one, I'm making 100 pair. And there's no graphic on the top, like no one, no one does that. Um, Surface did one and, and hats off to them for actually doing it. Um, and then just crazy graphics on the base with the, just all this like kind of internal meaning I've gotten there. This is Steve Stepp, he did this whole webisode uh, about the battle between skiers and snowboards. It's a total mockery of, of basically almost a civil rights thing and just he became a snowboarder and now he's like, I don't like skiers either and he, now he's snowboarding. And, I mean, dude, he's just hilarious. Like, he doesn't need to be in the, on the podium in the X Games. Like, that's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for someone that's, that's inspiring and motivating and people rally around. And it, and it doesn't even need to be serious. Like, skiing is not supposed to be serious. Like, it's fun. Like, stop being so serious. Like, don't worry. These skis are tech. Like, they're going to be the best skis in the world. Like, I wouldn't bother making skis if they weren't going to. I've been doing that for 18 years. Like, that's not the point of this brand. Like. That'll exist and that'll be something that you can go to the website and learn about all, all the reasons why it's so high tech. I'll just, I'm going to go ballistic with it so that you, you actually think they're even more high tech than they are, just like everyone. But um, it's, about, it's about doing something different, you know, just not being like only about that, only about like this is the best ski in the world. And that's, that's what I'm doing here. So, this, um, I'm also signing and numbering each one. Like that's what guys do with surfboards. That's what people do with artwork. That's how I think of these skis. You know, they really are artwork. Like they're graphically artwork and they're physical artwork. I mean, this is stuff that every ski designer, every engineer in the world that you don't know because no one lets you see it. Um, that's what they're doing. They're creating works of art that you slide around on and, um, and do different things on. So that's, that's a big part of it is just to meet the number sign and date each one and just make it feel like it's something special. I want you to go shred on these things. I want you to go destroy them. And then, you know, when you're, they're all raggedy and done, hang them on your wall then and say, hey, dude, that's one of 50, man. That's one of 20. You know, like, don't not enjoy it. You know, I used to, I have stockpiles of skis in my basement, like almost everyone I made are my favorites. And then I was like, I, I gotta just ride these things, you know, it's, it's all good. That's what they're made for. So anyway, it's a work of art that you can just go have a blast on. We shouldn't forget that. So, um, and it's not like my brand, talking about going opposite. So I just showed you everything opposite. So instead of trying to sell 2,000 of a model, like, I, like everyone in the industry does now where they're saying, well, we got to sell at least 500 or it's not worth making it. This is the opposite. I want to sell 10. I'll sell 50. I don't care. Like I want to do the exact opposite. I don't, I want to not have a giant logo. Where is my logo? What is my logo? It's like literally one little die cut on the tip and tail of the base. That's it. I don't even have a logo on, the, on this one I do, but I'm, not, I'm only gonna have a signature on the rest of them. I'm gonna let the artwork, whoever I collaborate with, I'm a person making skis. You're the party, you're the promotion in the front, I'm the business in the back. Like I'm basically gonna, gonna make a ski for dudes that deserve skis that I wanna work with that are cool, entertaining, inspiring, fun. So uh, I did, do, did one with Steve Step and doing one with New Schoolers, a whole community. You know, it doesn't have to be a person, it's a whole community of skiers that are all rallying and telling me what they want the graphic to be. It's cool, you know, in a couple of weeks we'll know what it is and, and then we'll go design it up and sell 20 or 50 of them, whatever you feel like making. And I, I wanna be able to do that any day of the week. Like on Monday, I wanna say, I got a good idea or I ride a chairlift for one of you guys and you have a good idea. I call my engineer where we start making a prototype. Two weeks later, we're skiing on it. The next day, we got the graphic ready. Boom, it's on the website, pre-order it. Boom, two weeks later, you can have it in your hand. I mean, I wanna do things in weeks or months, not years. It's too slow, like it's the speed of Twitter today. That's what I wanna work at. So again, there it is, there's the branding. There really is no branding on there. And that's my point, it's like this isn't my, this isn't my brand. This is, this is a extension of you in the form of a ski that I'm building. 
Um, and same with the pr clothing that I'll eventually get into. This is just an example, but like just a little J on the tail. And this is just like marketing uh, product. I mean, if you went to class for marketing and product, that would be good info. Anyway, Troy Lee Designs is kind of one of my inspirations. Like a designer collaborates with personalities and, and people. So that's like a motto. They, he decorates helmets. You know, Volcom, everyone loves Volcom. Youth Against Establishment, like I love that attitude. I've always had that with Lion. I still have that with this other brand, but it's a little twist on that. It has a little bit more of a, what the hell is that kind of, kind of uh, impression. Like I want you to look at an ad, like these guys enjoy, just kill it. This is a good example of expect the unexpected. I mean, that, that's a skateboard ad. You know, you, they don't have a picture of a skateboarder on there. It's like, we already know they make skateboards. It's like, I mean, anyway, you guys get it. And, and uh, that's, th those are my inspirations for, for this brand. So um, from concept to snow, weeks, not years. That's a big part of it. These are the presses. I'm going up to the factory tomorrow. It's up in Quebec, which is really cool because, you know, it's just faster. They speak English. They speak French, too. And we can ship it quickly, we can test it quickly, I can go up there and check it out. And it's local, man, like support the local economy. Like how cool would it be if everyone started making everything that we own here again? You know, this is a good first step. And I wanna be a part of that revolu next revolution. Again, opposite of whatever's going on. Everyone's outsourcing, we're building it here. Do I pay more for the product? Yes. But I'm selling it directly to you, so the retailer isn't taking his cut. So there's more money in there for me to put better materials in the ski, better processes, and, um, and I can make less, and it can cost me more, but it won't cost you anymore. It just means the middleman isn't making any money. So this is all part of the formula, again, of doing it different. If I sell to a retailer, my whole formula is done. You know, it just, it just, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't do both. I got nothing against shop, ski shops. I love ski shops. Sold them for years. Like, they're awesome. They're, you need ski shops. But me, right now, I need to do something different. I need to pioneer something different. This isn't the end all. This is just my little project here, you know? And, um, and I want to do it different because I want to experiment with what if. And uh, that's a big part of it. So buy local, too. You support, support me. I live here, man. You know? I'm going to go to a restaurant and give you a tip, man, when you're working there between, between school. Uh, <laughs> so direct sales. This is what traditional business is. Okay, basically the, the shop is taking 40, 45 to 50% of, of the sales. So let's say, just to school you guys on how it works, a $500 <laughs> ski, a shop buys from me for 250. Okay, so they make 250, and now I make 250. But in that 250, it cost me 200 to make it. So now I only make 50. Now, that guy, the shop needs 250 because he has to stack all this product. He has to pay people to sell it. He has to turn the lights on, do promotions. There's a ton of overhead for that, right? Plus, I got to pay a salesman to go sell it to the shop. And I got to give him the 6 to 8% of the, of the product cost, the wholesale cost. So now I'm paying him 8%. Then I need a sales manager to sit next to me so he can manage those two people and tell one to buy the product from the other. So, this is all part of the traditional system of the way business works, and it's quickly going away in some industries, and I want to experiment with being the first in skiing to try that. Um, you've got a 12-month buying cycle. You guys all know it. You know, trade shows in spring, there's the whole product line. That's the only chance the shop can buy it. Well, first, let me, let me say this. I'll develop it this winter, traditionally. We'll spend all summer developing this winter, into summer, we show it to the shops next winter, we sh build it the next summer, we ship it to the shops the next winter. So basically what you're skiing on right now is two year old product. What you got bought in the store, I developed two years ago, or I started at least a year ago. My skis, I will be developing a month ago. So it's just the speed of thought because you can, that's why. If you wanna say why, are you trying to put this out of business, are you trying to change that, are you trying to, no, I'm just doing it because you can. And that's what everyone else is doing in other industries, so why not give it a try? Maybe I'll fail, who knows? But I mean, it's like hitting a jump. You fall down, you get up, you figure out how to change what you're doing and, and try to stop it the next time. So the dealer also controls availability. You guys are gonna say, if I sold to dealers, the first thing you're telling me is, how come I can't find it in my town? Because the dealer controls what you see. That guy that sits in the shop, he decides what you have access to, not me. So I wanna take control and I'm gonna be the guy 
selling to this. And so I'm not selling to dealers, I'm selling to rep. This is who I'm selling to, you guys. I'm talking to you, I'm servicing you, I'm doing demos with you, I'm telling you about the product. I can sell it anywhere, anytime, any price. We can be in a parking lot, I'll swipe your credit card, take the pair, good. You know, this is 2013. All the margin, all the money, that's all that profit, I'm taking it, I'm putting it into a better product, and I'm also giving you a better price, and I'm making it here, because it costs more. And uh, I'm gonna be able to react faster. So marketing-wise, traditional marketing I'm gonna do. But I'm also gonna do untraditional stuff, man. I'm gonna do videos for every ski launch. You're gonna have a, a, a video of your ski being made. When you order it, you're gonna know when that thing's being made. You're gonna see the core being cut. You're gonna see the dude putting epoxy in the thing. Um, and it's for the young and the young at heart, man. It's anyone that wants something different, fresh, you know, fans of myself and what I've done and, and, and wants whatever's next. Um, and I'm just gonna show you, wrap this up with two videos. So this is an example of how we're promoting the skis, a little different. This is how we make the graphic. This is the screen of my graphic designer where I did it, a thousand times faster. And this is, this is how I introduce the brand. So think about everything I've said about in the past, and this is the summary of that, of all the different ways I could introduce this brand in the form of video, which is the strongest way to communicate. Um, and this is what I went with. And I, hopefully you get it. This month we're going to get annihilated. As 30.5 WTF Pro Bash Shops at Walmart proudly presents So that's, uh, that's what I'm up to and that's what I've done. <laughs> no skiing on my website yet. I'm going to see how long I can go without putting a picture of a skier. Who did those videos for you? Local. Local guy, he, he went to uh, uh, Champlain actually for video work. Yeah. Joe Gatani, Right Side Productions. And uh, the guy that um, runs line now, Josh Malchek, he was uh, sitting in, in your seat, you know, uh, eight years ago, nine years ago. And he came in as an intern and marketing coordinator, marketing manager, and now he has my job and he's running line in Full Till. I forgot to call out Full Till, I, I, I brought that brand back too. Um, under K2. But if you guys got any questions, fire away. Yeah. Are you planning on uh, competitively pricing the skis compared to like other brands? Yeah, they're just the same price. There's not, they're not high, they're not low, they're right where they should be and uh, yeah. Just giving you more for your money essentially. You know, just putting, I, for example like sidewalls, you don't see full height sidewalls anymore in freestyle skis because they're expensive. And, and, the, and, the, and the attitude is well, kids don't want to pay for that. And you can't because there's not enough room. But we've moved the, the distribution to go direct and suddenly there's plenty of room. Putting carbon in there, putting full-height sidewall, putting best fattest edge, fattest base. It's just 
everything that comes up, I just say, yeah, let's do it, let's do it. And like for years, that I just couldn't, you know, necessarily. Where did the line come from? Um, like skiing a line, like I used to be way into bumps because there were no parks, so you know, choose a line. Um, kind of inline skating a little bit too, um, but yeah, and it just ends up being like a path you take in life or on the hill or wherever. Yo. Uh, you made a couple of references and allusions to surfboard shaping. And I grew up surfing on the coast of Maine. I worked at a surf shop since I was like 16. And I would say the comparisons that you made to surfboard shaping, I would say that, um, that the art of shaping a surfboard is almost a dying breed, unfortunately. I was wondering if you've, uh, if you've uh, sort of looked into surf surfboard shaping and enough to know that I feel like, or I don't know, basically what I'm trying to say is that the, I find that the, the craftsmanship of surfboard shaping has kind of been eliminated through computer assisted technologies and whatnot and really hardly any surfboards are shaped by hand anymore. Um, they're all shaped with these machines and they're just finished off by hand. Right. So I mean, I'm not trying to say like, I'm like no, no, I, I know, I know exactly what you're talking about. To me, designing, shaping is designing. Like, I know they physically were shaping surfboards and, you know, and that's, and then now it's gone to CAD and it's all CNC and then, you know, finished by hand. And that's how skis are, that's how everything is. Like, you're gonna have, the, if you want consistency over even 50 pair, it's good to have like hard tooling that you cut with a machine, et cetera. I, I associate more with the word designing. Surfboard designers, I think of a designer as a shaper, it just happened to be they were physically hand shaping it. So now the guy that was hand shaping it, he still knows more than anyone else about how to design it, whether it's in CAD or it's by hand. And you're probably going to get a better board because he's going to be able to do them faster. So you're going to get, you know, more boards turned out faster. Like, no, he didn't use his hand, but like, you know, it, it's kind of like you decide the height of the grass to cut, but it doesn't mean you have to cut it with your hand. You're going to use a mower to do it. Like, it's the decision process that goes into creating that product that I think is similar. Um, but how you go about it, I don't think it has to be, I don't think I have to use like a knife to cut every core because in just the name of efficiency and consistency, you know? I don't know if that is what you were looking for, but it, I, I, I'm not a surfer, but I think it's rad that like that whole scene and how surfboard shapers are brands, you know, or companies, like you don't have to be this big company, you can just be a guy making surfboards, one-offs or however many, and I'd like to kind of bring that that craft beer mentality, which already exists in skiing, to just kind of that next level and just put my spin on that. Because I've, I've seen so many friends and people just like, yeah, I'm starting a ski company. I'm like, oh, dude, I want it. I wish I could do that again. And I was like, like, yeah, we're starting a ski company. I was like, oh, I got so many ideas I want to do. It's like, you know, I'm just like, I'm staying true to like lying. I'm just, every time I'm like, God, everybody's making a damn ski company. You know, screw it. I'm making a ski company. I got, I'm going to do this, you know, the way I, I think I should do it. And I think it's cool that everyone's doing it, you know, just like more flavor, the better. Yo. When uh, K2 bought line, they didn't make you sign a no compete clause? No, I was just a regular employee like everyone else. Um, you know, I think they're just, I don't know how else to put it, they're, they're regular, they're just a bunch of skiers, you know, at the end of the day, they're not out to, to, to take anyone for a ride or, or anything, and people leave, and they, they leave, sometimes they come back, too, you know, it's, it's like literally that company is a bunch of skiers that have worked their way up to running one of the best winter sports brands in, in the world, really, so, yeah, they're, they're pretty laid back, and I'm actually doing consulting for them now. So, you know, they call me anytime and get my two cents on, on whatever they're working on for any brand. Yep. Uh, two questions. On a scale of one to ten, how cool is Eric Holler? <laughs> <laughs> one. And two, do you anticipate collaborating with him at all and on JCs? Um well, Pollard's awesome, man. He's just a regular guy like any he's he's a regular person like any of us. He's a skier. I mean, through and through, and he's just super creative. Uh, so he's awesome. Yeah, he's as awesome as you think, and uh, but super chill too. So collaborating with him, it's like you know, he's he's rock solid with Line. Like he's such a good part of Line. I mean, I'm not, I'm the last person that's gonna say, hey, Eric, come over to what I'm doing. Like 
you know, I want to make a living. I don't think I could pay him, you know, what he's worth, to be honest with you. And I don't expect that. I think it's cool that he's there keeping, because he has such an influence over the brand too, um, and still driving stuff. I mean, so many products, so many models, no matter what it was made for, took something that he developed, you know. And that's the thing. It's not just me developing it. I'm like definitely, you know, steering the ship, but someone's got to rig the sails and et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, he's one of those guys. We got engineers, we got salesmen, we got you guys. Like half my ideas come from people I talk to that are like, yo, do you ever think of doing this? Or I really like that, I really don't like that. And it's just like the gears start turning. So, yeah. Since it's like such limited runs and it seems like you're mostly just trying to settle our mind, I guess. Um, yeah. Will there be like opportunities for like hold the speeds in person or something? Yeah. I gotta make them first, <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm gonna totally uh, get back to getting one-on-one -on -one with, like I was saying up there, like instead of selling it to a, to a store owner, um, which is necessary if you wanna see it in the store, I'm gonna sell it to you and I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna do demos with you, you know what I mean? Like we're gonna, I'm gonna get it out there and I, I'm looking forward to getting back on the hill in that way um, and finding new new ways for you guys to get involved too because I mean, look, look, it's the, the internet, you, you can't ignore it. You can curse it or you can, or you can leverage it. And that's what I plan on doing to get, I mean, all of you could be selling my skis. All you can be buying them, all of you can be demoing. I don't know how yet, but I think there's a way. I've gotten more people that say I want to help you than I have people buying my skis right now. So I just got to put two and two together, connect the dots and figure out, okay, how do I get these guys, like hundreds if not thousands of people to help me? Um, beyond like, hey, thanks, tell your friends, which is what I'm saying now, so. Yep. Um, at what point did it come to you that you wanted to bring back your teeth to the like Oh, the, the, Ra the Rakeley Flex on boot? Yeah. Um, when I went to work for K2 in 06, the president of the company brought me in his office, like literally the first day I was there, Robert Markovich, and he was, he, he said, what do you think of this boot? He held it up, a black, Rakeley basically without the logo and I was like oh I love that boot I skied it 10 years like that's the best boot ever he's like what do you think about bringing it back and I was like definitely I would I was just craving to prove that I could do something other than line um, and it was literally just that boot he's like I basically bought this mold for pennies on the dollar and it, it makes no sense to put it under the K2 brand name or have the K2 guys running with this it needs to be kind of its own thing I have this full tilt brand name that was a wakeboard brand that we used to own we already had the trademark so we take that name, this boot, do something with it. You got no money. You just use the people you're working with for line. You got no budget. You got no, you know, the resources you have for line, make something of this boot. And if you make something of it um, and you get up to X amount of pair, everything we learn from that, we're going to then apply to a K2 boot. And that's what just happened. They just came out with the boot um, because it takes a lot of practice to learn. And so anyway, yeah, I love that boot and it was awesome. And my goal with that was just looking at uh, brands like uh, Skull Candy, who took an existing product and just brought it, raised the bar through the roof, broke through the, that glass ceiling aesthetically. And I, I was like, this boot works. It just has to get up to speed aesthetically, athlete wise and every other way. And honestly, the product itself is what sells that thing because it just works. I mean, all those athletes that are on full tilt boots, they're not getting paid to be on full tilt boots. They're, they're on them because they work that good. And when it comes to boots, that connection between your, that's, that is the connection between your body and the product, ski. You know, if you don't have that connection right, you, you're gonna lose your ability. So though all those pros that you see on them, it's, it's purely because it works. And I was just lucky that I was able to apply what I did to a product that good. Yo. Um, do you consider ski step the first team rider now? And would you sign more people? I don't think we even sign a contract. We <laughs> I mean, the way I'm work, I don't like to say I'm like signing someone as a sponsored athlete, that whole sponsorship thing. I mean, it's, it's cool, but like, just go ski for the fun of it like he does. You know, like I'm basically, I see a guy that is inspiring, entertaining, awesome, six skier, the whole nine yards and I say, hey, you want to make a ski together? That's the conversation I've had and that's the conversation I'll continue. If we sell them, we'll make more. If we don't, we won't make more. 
it, it's, it's really that simple and it's just kind of a casual deal and I'm going to collaborate with anyone and everyone, whether they're a good skier or not, that just seems to fit and people want to be a part of. But does that mean he's on Netflix? He is, yeah. You can't really be sponsored yeah. in doing it. But, you know, I don't know where this will go and that's the whole point. You know, I just, I, I want to like wake up on Friday and say, you know what, this makes sense, this doesn't, and then the next week say, okay, let's go this direction. That, that's the freedom I've been looking for and that's what's going to enable me to move the quickest and, and kind of get one step ahead of whatever's happening at the time. What would you say is the biggest lesson you learned from the uh, reactor binding? That binding, the biggest problem with that binding was not being a, a financially big enough company and having enough distribution to sell enough. Like I couldn't sell enough, I didn't have the distribution to sell enough and because I didn't sell enough, I couldn't get a competitive price because I couldn't get a competitive price not a lot of people would buy it because it was expensive and because it was expensive not a lot of people would buy it but it, it you know goes round and round you kind of need this economies of scale as they call it where once you hit a certain mass you get this momentum where no matter what you make you know you make you make a piece of junk and it's going to sell because you have the distribution you have the demand you have the name the reputation the money to, to manufacture and everything we're we're really I mean, we're always pushing the limits with Lyme, but that was pushing it. I mean, that was, it was cool, it, you know, but do you think hard if, to maintain. If you had been in a similar position to K2, the full tilt, so you had like a sub-brand kind of branch after the binding, do you think that could have worked in it? That, yeah, I would say that there's definitely huge value. If you read any books on branding and positioning, there's huge value in separating that. Like, instead of trying to do two things and wearing two hats, you know, Lion was all about doing tricks and taking big risks, and here we are making the safest binding in the world. I don't know if that made sense, you know, at the end of the day. Um, you probably want to have it stand alone, you're right, and then associate it with whatever brands you think are, are the best fit for that. So that is, that is something, and, you know, maybe we could have licensed it. We did try to other brands, you know, to use with their name, but we were just so young. You know, we were just, it's the equivalent of being a kid, you know what I mean, and, and like, a scene where there's people that have 50 years experience. I mean, these binding companies have been around forever. It's super technical. And um, we came up with a, a really, really amazing idea that I would still love to see come to fruition, but it's going to take some money and, and smarts and distribution to do it. Yep. What happened to line boots? Well, that was, that was um, me wanting that Rakeley boot basically way back in the day when I was in Albany and we bought basically the snowboard version of that because that's all we could get access to and we sold a couple thousand of those. I mean, they're awesome, super, like really soft flex like you want. You gotta be able to flex your ankle, that's the whole thing. That's what makes full tilt good and that's what those were. But um, I think we never got up to the volume where we could do new things with it. You know, we were just kind of stuck with what existed where, you know, full tilt right now is investing in, in new molds and, and going to be coming out with more new stuff because they've hit that critical mass and they've got a big, strong operation behind them. Yeah. Does uh, your new model of like coming up with an idea and getting it out weeks later, are you producing everything in house or how are you? It's all up in Quebec, um, in house in terms of, yes, it's in the same factory. I'm not outsourcing overseas. Um, <coughs> And a lot of it is tweaks to a model that we could do too. You know, we could tweak the rocker, the flex pattern. I mean, we could, we could go nuts with variations. Right now, I mean, I'm just taking it one step at a time. Um, I'm still, I mean, I'm still trying to compress basically a year's worth of stuff into like months or months worth of stuff into weeks right now, just because to see if we can do it, you know, and, and I'm kind of doing it. So yeah, I, I think it's possible, <laughs> but we'll see. I mean, maybe if I get up to like thousands of pair, no, but I don't plan on selling thousands of pair. I don't need to sell thousands. Like if I'm just myself and I'm contracting out, you know, graphics guys and engineers and whatever, um, there's that, that, that point where like, if you own 20 pizza shops, people are gonna say, wow, you're really killing it. Like you got 20 locations. Well, you got 20 times the headaches too. You might have one location and you got 20 times the cost. So at the end of the day, you're making the same money owning 20 pizza shops as you are owning one pizza shop. The only difference is one is killing you and the other you're having a good time doing it. And this is where I'm trying to find where is that balance because 
if I want to sell through ret retailers, through shops, with the margin I lose, I'm gonna to have to sell 20,000 skis, literally. Like you can't have, have sustain a snowboard or ski brand in the traditional distribution without hitting 20,000 pair. And that takes years and you usually go out of business before you get there. So I'm trying to sell direct and, and only get up to a couple thousand. You know, if in five years I sell a couple thousand pair, that's cool, you know, it's all good. I can decide then if I wanna scale up or, or maintain. How scalable is JC? I don't know. <laughs> I've only been doing it for a few weeks, but <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm going to be able to do, I'm going to have to do things in advance on my end. If I got up to a few thousand pair, I may release them, you know, more real time to you. Um, but it's still a lot faster just because I am, I'm not spending 12 months selling to a shop first. I'm, those 12 months are spent selling to you, building and selling to you. But you know, we'll take it as it comes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you plan to address the seasonality of the ski business through like such a short period? Oh yeah. So I would love to sell skis year round. I mean, I could make other widgets and stuff, but it's not what I'm, I'd be strongest at. Um, I think there's potential to sell stuff in the summer if, if once. I mean, for me right now, the challenge is getting people on the product and getting those experiences snowballing. And once that happens and people are like, I love that model, I'm down with that, or I, I trust this model and I, want, I wanted a wider version of it, I think I could sell, have a lot better chance of selling year round. Um, there's summer camps and people that are, I'm only selling to the core. I'm selling to the people that they don't wait for snow. You know, that's who I want to sell to. Um, I could sell to a very mainstream consumer. I can build. You know, skiing magazine line was on the cover this month, ski of the year. You know, that was my last ski that I helped develop and I can build design, you know, that category, that level of fairly mainstream ski, but that's not really my intention here. That's already being done by other companies. Um, so I think, I th yeah, I think I'll be able to do, it just depends on where it all lands, you know, but I, I hope to do it in the summer too, sell a few hundred or something. Maybe sell 10 at a time in the summer. Cool. Maybe we'll wrap it up here. All right. If you have more questions, uh, Jason will stick around. I just come on over to my house after. It's right down. <laughs> but Jason, yeah. thank you. And I just want to right. tell everybody, if you haven't realized it, you have just heard one of the best marketing lectures you will ever hear. And with no offense to the marketing faculty, uh, I am. But seriously, that, that, you don't realize it. You're, a, you're an educator as well as a... My uh, parents are both teachers, so well, I owe it to okay, them. Okay, man. Okay, so marketing is teaching, too, well, if you think you about go. it. But I, I, mean, right I meant that sincerely. That <laughs> Thank was great. You. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks a lot. Wonderful. Thank right you. on, guys. Thank you.